Good morning. Welcome uh, back to New Covenant Church. The vision of New Covenant Church is to see Christ preached from all the scriptures, love extended unto the church, the city, and the world, and to see lives transformed by the power of the gospel. So for many of us, this is our first time back in the building worshiping since February. And uh, I hope that you really enjoy being back in our beautiful space. We're going to ask that we keep our face coverings on throughout uh, the whole service just to be considerate of uh, people around us and uh, protect each other's health. And we also hope that uh, we will remember what we've been learning lately about the church, that church is not ultimately about people inhabiting a building, it's about the Spirit of God inhabiting a people. So let's pray to that end right now. Lord, we pray today that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil. Lord, meet us in prayer, meet us in song, meet us in scripture, meet us in preaching, and meet us in our love for one another. Amen. join me in joyfully affirming our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we are uh, terribly excited to have the Higgins family here with us this morning. John's going to be serving God's word to us this morning. John is a faithful husband and father and man of God. And if uh, you don't already love John, uh, because he was a member here for seven years, I predict that you will grow to love him within the next 40 minutes. He was, like I said, part of our church for seven years. They currently live in Carroll Stream, where John serves Christ in marketing and in video production and in a podcast, um, at least according to LinkedIn. Those are the three things he's busy doing now. We'll see what he does next year. And uh, so we're really grateful that he's going to lead us through Acts this morning. I uh, just want to take a moment here, since we're not passing the offering plate, uh, to let you know that if you brought your gifts uh, to the Lord, you can deposit them in the offering box at the back of the sanctuary as you exit. And uh, just note that it's our privilege um, to continue to give a portion of the Lord's provision to him, back to him each week, directly to his work, trusting him to use it for his kingdom. So will you join me in prayer? Father, as we look at the uncertainty and complexity of the world and of our lives, sometimes we have no idea what you are up to in the world. We often think that we would run things differently. We would write the story of our life differently. If it were our story to write, we would have made ourselves a little taller, a little funnier. We would have given ourselves perfect teeth or perfect kids we would give ourselves different jobs, different incomes, different friends, maybe even different families. Lord, your sovereign providence unfolds world history and our own histories in ways that baffle us. But Lord, none of us gets to write our own stories. Disney is wrong. We are not the authors of our own destiny. We are not self-made men or women or children. Lord, your word compares us to lumps of clay on your pottery wheel. Isaiah 29, 16 shows how ridiculous it is for clay pots to critique our maker. Isaiah writes, Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the thing made should say of its maker, He did not make me, or the thing formed say of him who formed it, He has no understanding. Lord, Father, this week we have been like that clay. We've been stubborn clay at times. We've fought your plan to use trials to form our souls to be more like your son, Jesus. We've complained about the situations you've put us in. We've worried about the future you have planned for us. At times we've not given our potter much to work with. And so, Lord, we are sorry. And so right now, with one voice, as your church, we kneel and we ask you to forgive us. Lord, look on the scars of your crucified son and accept his obedient life and death as payment for our sins this week and for all of our sins forever. And Lord, may Jesus' love and his forgiveness, may his death for us soften our hearts. Will you take away our hardness toward you so that we may be pliable, cooperative, willing clay. Because we know the one who is shaping us. As Isaiah 64, 8 says, but now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Lord, we are overwhelmed to recall that the one who is shaping us is the father who gave his only son to make us his own sons and daughters. And so, Lord, we pray that you would show the Vistos family your crucified and fatherly hands as Steve's mom is passing from this life into glory. Lord, we thank your hands that guided the surgeons who gave Joanne Cairns her pacemaker on Monday. And we praise you for answering her prayer to testify to her nurse that her peace came from Christ. Father, we pray that you would keep Mary Olds in your loving hands, even in a nursing home, 
as she suffers from her liver hardening. And Lord, when life spins out of control for our teenagers, our struggling families, our depressed brothers and sisters, remind them that you always control the spinning, that we are on your pottery wheel, and that all who trust in you will one day be perfectly formed after the image of your son. So, Father, as we turn to your all-powerful word now, may you hold John Higgins in the palm of your hands. Would you give form and shape and power to his message that we may encounter Christ and be formed by you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our New Testament reading today is Acts chapter 4, verse 32, through chapter 5, verse 11. Acts 4, 32 through 5, 11. I invite you to please stand for the reading of God's word and to remain standing as we sing the doxology. Hear the word of the Lord. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. This is God's word. It's uh, really good to be back. It's really good to see everyone again. I'm very thankful for the opportunity to to see and to teach here again, so thank you. Um, Let's open up in prayer. Father, I pray that you would open our eyes, that we might behold wonderful things out of your word and store it up on our hearts that we might not sin against you. 
Amen. So Jesus is resurrected, Acts chapter 1, and for 40 days he lives with the apostles and the tiny church, teaches them about the kingdom of God, and he says that they must wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit. Now, why do they have to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit? Well, if you remember back to the first verses of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, but the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That is to say, God's Spirit is ready to create. And then in the next six days, he will. And so in the beginning, God's spirit was the means of creation. And you see, Jesus' kingdom, the one that he's been proclaiming since the beginning of his ministry, all the way up to when he ascends into heaven, is not just a small political kingdom in the land of Israel, but it is the whole creation. And so just as the Spirit of God was the means of creation in God's first kingdom, when Jesus comes here and he restores his kingdom, it will be the means as well. So that's why they have to wait in Jerusalem for the Spirit. So the Spirit comes, and Jesus says when this happens, they will be witnesses from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Earth, think creation, the whole world, right? The spirit is going to go out and it's going to create a whole new ordered creation once again. So the tiny church is gathered in Jerusalem. The spirit comes and what happens? We get the first taste. We get the first taste of this witness of Jesus and his kingdom spreading to the whole world. Why? Well, they start speaking in like 15 different languages, right? What is that but expansion to the whole world in different languages? And they're telling about Jesus' kingdom and his resurrection. And how do the people at first respond? They say, oh, they must be drunk. They say they must be drunk with new wine, is what they say, which, of course, they are, but not the new wine that they're thinking of. They're not drunk on alcohol. They are drunk on the Holy Spirit, the blood of Christ, what what Peter or Paul will say in the book of Ephesians, don't be filled up on alcohol, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the new wine in which they are drunk with. So Peter gets up here in Jerusalem when the Spirit falls and he gives a speech about Jesus and his kingdom and 3,000 people are saved. So this tiny church is growing and we get the first glimpse about how this church is growing. And you saw this, we read this before, that they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the sacrament, to the prayers, People, the church is becoming wildly generous with their goods, and they are praising God. Okay, so the next scene is we have Peter and John, and they're going to the temple to pray like normal, and there's a lame man there, and they heal this lame man, and the people are amazed, and they gather around, and once again, Peter witnesses to these people. He tells them about what's going on, right? About Jesus and his kingdom. Well, how do the people respond? Well, you have the priests, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees, and they don't like what Peter is preaching about. So they take Peter and John, they throw them in jail. Well, that's fine. That's no problem. God raised Jesus from the dead. Joseph was in prison. Daniel was in prison. This is like normal Christian home, okay? So this is no problem. So Peter will preach there, and he preaches again, and now 5,000 people are saved. So that makes what? No, 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 no. 8,000 we're up to, okay? The tiny church is expanding. It's getting bigger and bigger. Well, Peter and John are released, 
They go back to the church, and how does the church respond after their leaders are jailed? Well, they're scared, and they cower. No, 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 that's not what happens. Here's how the church responds. They say, uh, yeah, this is what we expected. We've seen this in the Old Testament. They quote Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? The peoples plot in vain. The, the, the kings of the earth set themselves against the Lord and against his Christ. So they say, this is, this is, this is to be expected, right? This is not a strange way God's kingdom is advancing. So their leaders are jailed. They pray more spirit. And here's what Luke says. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. This is 431. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. That's what happens to the church when their pastors are jailed. Okay? So that's what's happened by the time we get to our text that we're going to look at this morning. In our text, we're going to look at two stories two contrasting stories of generosity. So, chapter 4 and verse 32. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Notice the natural effects of the filling of the Spirit. The narrator provides us with two. Unity and purpose and unity and property. First, purpose. Okay, it, it's more than just purpose. It's like their whole personhood. They say they had one heart and soul. A phrase I believe has not occurred in Scripture before and has not occurred as applied to God's people before. So what, what is the spirit effect? A novel and profound unity. And this unity, second thing, results in a willing sharing of property. Now, many of us bristle at this suggestion of shared property, but... Look at the order of action that Luke, our narrator, gives us. Luke does not say they had everything in common and then they had one heart and soul, but their one soulness was placed first. That is to say, they were happy, willing, joyful to share their property. Their sharing of property was the result of their one soulness. If you were to ask Peter and John about this, we'd be like, we were delighted to do this. This is wonderful. No one coerced us to do this. This was great. So perhaps our bristling, if we have it, should lead us to prayer for God's filling of the Spirit that we might have the one soulness and have no bristling at all. Next, Luke will tell us, verse 33, and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Now, Luke, more than any other New Testament author, will describe Jesus and the Holy Spirit's work as powerful, and here, the apostles are giving their testimony with great power. It's not weak or timid or hushed. I like the way that one theologian describes the, the, the kind of tone of uh, some or many Christians. He says, um, some of these Christians are apologetic, restrained, hesitant, a sorrowful diminuendo towards embarrassed silence by way of prolonged clearings of the throat, an occasionally softly whistled tune as one contemplates changing the subject before anyone is so indiscreet to venture a firm opinion. I have little patience for the notion that we know so little that we must abandon our efforts to advance the story of Christ 
as the true story of the world. End quote. Indeed, the apostles spoke powerfully, strongly about the resurrection of Jesus. And this powerful action resulted in great grace on the whole community. A phrase, I must admit, I don't know what it means. But I do desire to partake in it. And perhaps, if we can become stronger with our proclamation of Christ's resurrection, we might discover what great grace actually means. Well, verse 34. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. So Luke returns again to the sharing of property and becomes more particular. He tells us that people sold their lands and houses. And in a strange reversal of the Old Testament practice, where the land was distributed to families, to tribes, you remember those long sections in the book of Joshua, this new Israelite community, land is handled differently. The Christians willingly dispossess themselves to give land to the needy. The land is no longer bound by family, but bound only by love. This reminds me of Paul's statement in Romans, owe nothing to anyone but to love. Love is our only obligation. And so the land distribution is not dictated by family, but by poverty. Verse 36. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, our narrator gets even more particular, and we're going to talk about an individual, a gracious individual, Joseph and his act of generosity. Now, this may seem like a strange insertion, but it actually continues Luke's themes of generosity and the character of this new Israelite community. Joseph was a Levite. And there are some peculiar things about our Levite here. First, he's not from Israel. He's from Cyprus, an island off the coast of Israel. And secondly, he owns property. If you remember, Levites in the Old Testament did not own property because as Moses tells us, their property, their possession was God himself. But this Levite owns property and it's outside, presumably, the land of Israel. But like many others, Joseph, the Levite, will dispossess himself to care for the community. So in this wonderful, this beautiful, strange reversal of the Old Testament practice, the kingdom is expanding here, not by getting new land, but by giving up land and giving it to your neighbor. Now, I skipped over a repeated phrase, which is never good, and that phrase is laid at the apostles' feet. In both of the bringings of property to the apostles that we've just seen, Luke describes that as laying at the feet. I want you to remember that. We will come back to it. Okay, so this is the first story of generosity that we're going to see. Now the second story, Ananias and Sapphira. Verse 1. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property... And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought, it on, brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias is a Hebrew name that means God has favored or been gracious. But God's graciousness to Ananias was not enough. And like Adam and Eve's vying for knowledge in the beginning, and with his wife Sapphira's knowledge, he takes what is not his. Ananias had sold property for the church, but brought only part of the money to the apostles. 
Okay, verse 3, and for the first time, we get a character speaking in our scene. Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Peter addresses Ananias, and he tells us that Ananias' action was not a minor fib, but the work of Satan, the only act of Satan in the book of Acts. And this satanic-inspired action was a lie to the Holy Spirit. Notice, in contrast to the one heart of the church, Ananias' heart is filled with deceit. The Spirit filled the heart of the church while Satan has filled the heart of Ananias. Peter then asks five questions to Ananias to which he has no response. And Peter indicates that this is a lie to the Holy Spirit and to God. And here we uncover the nature of the evil. It is not that Ananias had property or money, but that he lied to God. And if we make explicit what is implicit here, Ananias had committed to giving the property to God, but then lied and kept back part of it. Verse 5. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now, this story is here not just to give us a moral lesson about honesty. And if this story sounds familiar, then you have good Bible senses. Because this story is very similar to a story in the Old Testament about Achan and the battle of Ai. And that's intentional because this story is alluding to that story. If you remember, in the story of Achan, we're talking about the conquest of the land God has given them. But, and that's true in our text as well. But there's, note, a difference because this conquest that's happening in Acts has a different character. Here, the land is given away from one brother to another, as we've seen. And the reason this story alludes back to Achan and the battle of Ai is to tell us this little church, this new little Israel has a new conquest, and the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. It hasn't changed. Verse 7. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Holy Spirit? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Luke has decided to tell the story of Ananias and Sapphira in two parts. First Ananias, and then Sapphira. Why? They're very similar stories. Could have just told them as one. He could have just said, Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit, they breathed their last, and they got carried out. No, but Luke has told it in two parts. If you remember, the church had one heart and soul. They had everything in common. Ananias and Sapphira are the opposite. They are not one heart and soul. They are divided. Luke has separated their stories because they themselves are separated. Their deception has divided them. Notice, Luke told us that Sapphira had knowledge of what her husband was doing, but she had no knowledge of his death. Their deception separated them from God, from their property, and from each other. 
And with a dark note, Luke tells us that they are buried together. That is, when unity no longer matters. Because they refuse to lay the money at the feet of the apostles, they themselves will lie at the feet of the apostles. The same word that was used twice for the bringing of the money to the apostles is used when Ananias and Sapphira are brought out dead. Indeed, they are the wealth that should have been laid at the feet. Ananias' name, we remember, means favored, and Sapphira means sapphire. And so this wealthy couple unwillingly lays their wealth themselves at the apostles' feet. Luke concludes his story in this way. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. In the first scene, the community was filled with great grace. And here we conclude the second scene with great fear. So, as the Spirit is expanding the kingdom to the whole earth, Sometimes there will be internal battles. So we have Ananias and Sapphira here with the deceit. Sometimes we will have external battles. We see at the beginning the people thought this church was drunk. They thought uh, then the leaders were jailed. And in a few chapters we're going to see the first martyr, Stephen. And the answer to both battlefronts is the strategy that produced the one heart and the one soul, the generosity toward the needy, and the power to speak boldly about the resurrection. And that strategy came in the verse right before our section. Let me read it again. This is Acts 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Prayer. Prayer is not a mere meditation. Prayer is speaking to a person, asking God to do things. It is ceasing from our action and asking God to work and to change things. And by his spirit, he powerfully does. Let us pray. Father God, we're thankful for your spirit. We're thankful for the stories of um, extreme generosity and prayer. And also for the fearful stories, Lord, because we need both. Um, fear is something that we often lack, Father, but um, the beginning of wisdom is fear, Lord. And so I pray that we would be a people of prayer, that you would give us a fresh filling of your spirit, that you would give us the unity of one soulness, Lord, and you would give us great generosity as your kingdom expands. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
May God make you of one heart and soul so that we may experience his great power, his great grace, and his great fear. You may be seated.